Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm really honored by the presence of uh, Mr. Ambassadors, fellow colleagues from various missions, uh, the pleasure of which I have working with. I am really honored on this very cold day, which is minus 11 still outside. Uh, it is a privilege and it's a pleasure to see all of you here today. Uh, this project has been going on for some time. Mehmet Bey is always uh, coming to me and saying that we should do something about this ambassador's luncheon series with me. I was always telling him that I was not an ambassador yet, so I was postponing it, postponing it, postponing it. But uh, at the end, I couldn't say because my government, as Mr. Kaka has mentioned, um, has promoted me to become the ambassador in Bangladesh. But I was a little bit skeptical, I was a little bit um, reserved due to the fact that uh, I was not officially assigned as ambassador. Yes, I was notified, but the, 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 the decree of the government was not uh, published in the official Gazette, which makes me officially an ambassador. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, this was published this morning in the Turkish official Gazette. <laughs> So uh, the topic we chose as a Turkish foreign policy, as we are living in an era or in the time of Twitter, I'm not going to make you get bored by a long speech in details or whatever. Rather try to give you small spotlights through which we can maybe enlarge our, let's say, discussion over the Turkish foreign policy. Um, I would like to thank Peace Island Institute for giving me the opportunity for organizing this event. Uh, the, the series, actually, um, there were uh, a couple of, I think so far we have seven of them, and I am at the eight, uh, and there were very formidable speakers. One of them is here with us, Ufuk Gökçen Ambassador of OIC, permanent uh, uh, observer of, of the OIC. Uh, and it's very helpful. It's very helpful due to the fact that uh, it gives the, the, the opportunity for us diplomats to exchange views or to share the, the, uh, the views of our governments, our countries, or our personal views with a wider public uh, in the United States, especially in New York, uh, with the, the community uh, who is, which is very much interested in what's going on in the world. And it is, of course, um, such actors like Peace Island Institute and the others, other NGOs, to create awareness about the international relations uh, and the, the issues that are our main concern, to bring it to the attention of the general public, uh, to open a new perspective from that. Because diplomacy is today is not the diplomacy of 50 years ago or 100 years ago. It is a diplomacy with lots of actors in it. Definitely Peace Island Institute has proven in the last couple of years itself that it is contributing very positively to the discussions uh, in that field. So uh, I commend your studies or your work and then I would like to uh, encourage you to go further with this. Um, I prepared notes, you know, and I, I got some speaking or talking points, but before going into details about this thing, let me tell you uh, my personal experience, I was in Ankara uh, at the beginning of the year to attend the Ambassadors uh, Conference. Uh, Ambassadors Conference is uh, the conference organized by the Turkish Foreign Ministry uh, to which uh, about 200 Turkish ambassadors attend, those who are actively working throughout the world as well as uh, the, the ambassadors which are positioned in Ankara. Uh, we gather to exchange views and we got briefings. We got briefings this year from three deputy uh, prime ministers and eight ministers, as well as other high-level uh, dignitaries from the state structure, um, and also from some civil society institutions. Um, it was quite interesting. Uh, I have to say that it is very eye-opening due to the fact that we had the chance to learn what has been going on because sometimes 
take for example in the UN and we are really privileged to, to see many world affairs through the prism of, of uh, the United Nations but our colleagues in uh, some parts of the world are not so much uh, I would say lucky to see what's going on in the world to see from different perspectives so we had the chance to exchange views share our opinions and then try to see what we are where we are going, how the world is changing. One of the most interesting lectures, or uh, I would say briefings, was obviously from the foreign minister. From the foreign minister himself, Mr. Davuto. I'm not saying this because he promoted me as ambassador, but I'm saying this sincerely that he is, he was very, very uh, exclusive and very interesting. In his speech he made uh, in the university in Izmir, uh, he actually mentioned three earthquakes which changed the history in the last 20 years. The first earthquake, he said, was the collapse of the communist system, uh, the end of the Cold War. So this was in 1991. And according to Mr. Davutoglu, uh, the second earthquake that changed the, the world has been or was the 9-11 uh, event that happened here in, in New York. And the third one is what has happened in, on both sides of, of the Mediterranean in 2011, uh, both in, the, uh, in the, what we say in the northern part of Africa and in the uh, in Middle East, uh, the Arab Spring it is called widely, and also what is happening today to the European Union. So. Based on this, this thing, um, Mr. Davutoglu, Minister Davutoglu says that Turkey has been trying to cope with also to, to place itself in the new world order depending on what's happening in the world after these three earthquakes, which changed the structure or which changed the understanding <coughs> of the world order in the last 20 years. So. Today we're talking about a dynamic Turkish foreign policy. What is the dynamism? According to, to th those you know, the, 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 who are studying Turkish foreign policy, they say that the dynamism of the Turkish policy is mainly based on the domestic advances and changes in the international setting. Turkey is no longer a flank country as it was during the Cold War. We now find ourselves at the epicenter of a geopolitical landscape hosting many risks and opportunities that would define the future of our globe. <coughs> Politically, economically, socially, and culturally, the risks and opportunities of this era mainly revolve in this wide neighborhood where Turkey lies. And Turkey is very, very well poised to make a vital and constructive impact on the course of developments therein. With its fast-growing economy, social dynamism, improved democratic standards, emanating from a well-established <laughs> set of values and a clear vocation, unique historical ties with a large number of countries in all four directions and a rich cultural diversity, Turkey's soft power is more relevant and effective than ever in a wide ge ge geography. The main principle of our quest for peace and stability is to create a zone of cooperation and dialogue around us. While doing so, we prioritize capitalizing on possible opportunities of cooperation instead of confronting each other on issues of disagreement. We believe that the more we make strides in enhancing cooperation and creating a positive interdependence, the easier it will be to resolve differences or harder for them to turn into conflicts. This is precisely the idea behind our zero problems with neighbors policy. Of course, we are not naive to expect the resolution of all problems in a short period. But it reflects our orientation to actively strive to resolve them through dialogue and cooperation. Results will come through time and when there is mutual willingness on the side of our counterparts. We believe that it is of, of utmost importance that we help opportunities prevail over risks and threats. The second principle for us 
is this, that the security cannot be enhanced at the expense of freedoms. <clears throat> this is indeed the fundamental philosophy of the governance in Turkey. In all our relations, we encourage democratic governance either by example or through our policies and programs. We believe that sustainable democratic systems can only be founded and flourish if and when they are based on the will and choices of the people. Therefore, we make calls for democratic reforms. We know that relations among democracies are more reliable and predictable as they enjoy the support of their people. Turkey's approach to the citizens in the Arab world fully reflects this understanding. We see it as an opportunity for the democratization of the entire region and consider it to be an irreversible process based on the will of the people. As such, our support to the legitimate aspirations of the people is unwavering. We are also aware that Turkey is in a special position to make a positive difference in the region. Turkey provides a source of inspiration to the countries in the region, given its fast-growing economy, social dynamism, improved democratic standards, and the rich cultural diversity. The third principle, the guiding principle, is regional ownership. The region we are situated in has a long history, and the problems are often more complex and deep-rooted than they seem. This requires the solutions to take into account the regional dynamics. Therefore, regional ownership is indispensable in finding and implementing long-lasting solutions. To this end, we have to create an environment where all regional actors can become part of the solutions and agree on a common vision based on their shared interests. We see that the center of gravity in the world politics has changed considerably over the past decade. Particularly, we see that um, the political influence is moving towards Asia and Latin America, as well as Africa. The circle of international decision-making is also growing wider, and new configurations of countries are emerging. Turkey, in many aspects, is among those emerging powers, as, for instance, evidenced by its membership in G20. The dynamism and vigor in our foreign policy, therefore, obliges us to refocus our economic <coughs> efforts, particularly towards these new economic powers and markets in Asia, Latin America, and Africa, without in any way weakening our ties with Europe and transatlantic alliance. Here I would like to just uh, refer to the number of Turkish embassies that we opened very recently in African countries. I think three years ago, three or four years ago, the number of embassies which we had in Sub-Sahara was 12. Today we have throughout, uh, sorry, in all Africa we had 12 uh, embassies. Today we have 34 after three years. Uh, and then there are plans to open two more to carry the number to 36 altogether. The last one is going to be opened in Chad and Djibouti. Therefore, the number that will go to, to 36. Um, as I said, um, Turkey pursues its relationships, the new relationships, in tandem with its strategic allies and partners in the West. EU membership remains a strategic goal for Turkey. We believe that Turkey's EU membership will be mutually beneficial for both sides. It will also have positive implications all over the globe. Of course, expanding and deepening our outreach <coughs> as such made us even more sensitive to the conflicts in various regions and propelled us to be more active in helping their resolution. We have spearheaded numerous mediation and facilitation initiatives in regions around us, from Central Asia to the Balkans and the Middle East. As Mr. Kaka mentioned, we have had uh, uh, the role in mediation efforts in the Middle East between Israel and Syria. And not only this, we also had created trilateral dialogue processes in the Balkans between Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and, uh, and uh, Serbia, uh, Croatia, and Turkey. These are trilateral um, cooperation processes which we, we have helped started. Uh, likewise, we have another 
process going on with Afghanistan and Pakistan and Turkey. And um, there is also another one which we are uh, trying to contribute to between the P51 and Iran on the nuclear issue. Um, as again mentioned by Mr. Kakar, together with Finland, uh, we have uh, created the Friends of Mediation Group. Today, uh, I am uh, pleased to, to mention that there are 42 members uh, in, the, in the group, 34 countries, and uh, hopefully in a very short time, Montenegro has become the 35th country to, to become the, the Friends of Mediation. Um, not only limited to the mediation, but also we are together with, uh, with Spain um, co-chairing, co-sponsor the Alliance of Civilizations, which we are very much proud. Today, over 100 countries in the United Nations joined this initiative and are working for its success. Um, as I mentioned, the United Nations, there are uh, other, other areas that we are trying to contribute to. One of them is the development issues. Of course, um, I am glad to see that Turkey is becoming as, as, as emerging as a donor country. Um, the the uh, official development uh, uh, assistance of Turkey has reached 1.5 billion dollars to over 100 countries. We are giving uh, official development assistance, and uh, the Turkish development agency TICA is very much active in various parts of the world, especially in Africa and in Asia. Uh, but not limited to that, in all parts of the world they are really working hard and I have to say gladly that TICAs and other NGOs um, uh, are really very much helping to the work of the Turkish Foreign Ministry because in the past all these things were followed by the diplomats uh, whose maybe main job is to follow the political developments and then you know develop the relations between the two countries uh, but now we have new <coughs> actors in the field who, which are helping with the development projects, coming and helping, and this is a, a kind of a teamwork, and we are very much happy that TICA, with its uh, support to the work of the Turkish Foreign Ministry, is making our successes are more visible. Um, as, as I said, in the UN, we have um, for example, in 2011, hosted the LDC summit in Istanbul, and uh, there, there, at the, there, at the summit, the ambitious action plan for the next 10 years have been adopted, which is uh, a, a concrete achievement of this conference. So, as we are moving forward, as we have uh, gained confidence, as we have become more active, of course it is reflected in our bid to become um, more active in the, inter in the United Nations. Uh, as you will all recall, in 2009 uh, and 2010, Turkey served as a non-permanent member of the, of the Security Council, and we have got 152 votes when we were elected. Uh, so. Uh, we believe that we actually lived out the expectations of those countries who voted for us and now uh, after only five years after we leave, now we want to go back to the Security Council and we are bidding for the elections for 2015 and 2016. Um, we, as Mr. Kakar mentioned, uh, are also uh, having a, a growing economy. <coughs> you have said 17, but in Ankara they told us that we are 16. I hope that we just got up one more. 16 largest economy in, in the world. This is quite impressive. Uh, the GDP is uh, assessed for the year 2012 uh, 780 billion dollars. Um, and for this number, if you, you calculate the 70, almost 75 uh, million um, people living in the country, it's about $10,000 per capita income. This is uh, something uh, which we were never dreaming, let's say, 20, 30 years ago. Um, let me uh, also say a couple of things which impressed me when I was in Turkey. Um, we were told that the Turkish representations throughout the world is today 209. 
uh, including the embassies, the permanent missions, and the consulate generals. And by this number, we are number nine in the world. So we are aiming to carry this number to 233 uh, in the next uh, three, four years, and we aim to become uh, number six after the P5, number six in the world uh, on the 100th anniversary of the Republic of Turkey in 2023. So this is a, 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 a very ambitious uh, target, but it's not unachievable. I think we can achieve this because we are uh, really, really uh, working very hard. Our colleagues in the foreign ministry, we are going through a dynamic process in the country as well. So these are basically the elements of the Turkish foreign policy. But I have mentioned, you know, the questions, I believe that as, as I was invited to answer the questions, the synopsis was written here by Mr. Mehmet and uh, his colleagues, uh, which has some kind of striking questions at the end. And of course, uh, many people try to find answers to these questions today. And Turkey's foreign policy is very much affected, of course, what is happening in its region. I have mentioned um, very briefly the zero policy, zero problems with neighbors policy. Uh, it is a policy, it's not a new policy actually, it is a policy, it is the understanding from the very beginning of the foundation of the Republic. So when you look, Turkey has always tried to achieve peace in the country so that it can be reflected abroad. So that was what Atatürk was giving as a kind of advice to the newly created nation saying, you, if you create peace and harmony within yourself, then you reflect peace outside and vice versa. But if you have peace outside, it will be reflected on you as, as peace. Therefore, this policy uh, has been the one of the fundamental elements of the Turkish foreign policy, which may be, uh, uh, I would say, recategorized or re-named um, uh, as a zero uh, problems with neighbors policy. Of course, uh, it's, it sounds like a cliche, but it takes two to tango. So it can, nothing can happen only with the willingness or with the, uh, with the, let's say, political will of the Turkish side. It has, it requires the others to respond in the same manner so that we can have zero problems. So the idea, uh, uh, as I said, I try to explain, is to focus on the, the common things that we agree rather than those who, which we disagree that would make us or lead us to conflicts. Um, the positive result or concrete results of this policy as you might see in a couple of last couple of years or whatever, the trade volume between Turkey and its immediate neighbor has grown four times and uh, the visa uh, the, the, with the visa, easing of the visa regulations, many people around our neighborhood are coming to Turkey and vice versa. So the interaction between the people is increasing day by day. Of course, um, as I said, we are not saying that these problems will be solved immediately overnight. It won't be. There are some of them are very deep rooted, but the most important thing is to have the political will. Do we have that political will? Yes, we do have the political will. Do the others have the political will? Yes, some of them, but some of them are not ready. So what we do, we encourage our partners to have the political will as strong as possible to work with us so that we can find or create a better future for us. Um, as regards Syria, Syria is a bleeding wound. Um, we are, uh, as an immediate neighbor, we are very much upset what's happening there. Um, today, we see that the international community came to the point that there is a need for a transition in the country. This is what we have been saying from the very beginning. This is what we were saying, what my minister and the others were trying to go and talk to 
uh, Mr. Assad and convince him there is an urgent need for a transformation, that there is an urgent need for the reforms in the country. But unfortunately, we couldn't convince him. Unfortunately, I say because it cost 60,000 lives. Uh, innocent people died. 60,000 people. Was it worth this? We believe that it wasn't. And now where we come today, the international community, as I said, is saying that there is a need for a change. Um, frankly, it's a personal opinion, and I believe that this opinion is shared by many. Uh, Mr. Assad could be a hero of change in his country. He could be a hero of change in the Arab world, which has been affected by the Arab Spring. But he chose to take the wrong side of the history. And by his actions, unfortunately, we believe that he will not be remembered as a hero, but he will be remembered by the brutal policies he has pursued vis-a-vis -vis his own people. Therefore, um, Syria remains to be a main concern for Turkey, and, but we still believe that Syrian people deserve the best. Four million people in need of help. Uh, 650,000 refugees, 2 million in, uh, IDPs in the country. Um, we are hosting about 160,000 people in Turkey in 15 camps which we have created. Already Turkey spent over $400 million to um, accommodate these people. We, we call them our guests. We have pursued the policy of open, open door policy towards these people um, and we will continue to do so. And what we want, we want the democracy prevail in the country and through the elections, the true representatives of the Syrian people come to power. Um, as I mentioned the Syrian refugee issues, um, I might jump to the question number four. As I have said, and I have, uh, I think, mentioned the mediation efforts that we have been um, we have been talking, maybe one of the mediation things which we have not success, we couldn't succeed to convince the international uh, community uh, is about Cyprus. Um, you know the details very well, um, but very briefly I will say, as Mr. Kakar said, I have worked on Cyprus issue for such a long time. Uh, it is an issue which Turkey, again, has the political will together with the Turkish Cypriots uh, to sort, solve this problem in the most quickest and most, I would say, acceptable way for both sides. We are not saying that it will be solved as we like. We say that the Turkish Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots, for the mutual benefit of those two people on the island, um, can so, they, they can find a solution that is um, acceptable for both sides, whereby the Turkish Cypriots will live in dignity as partners on the island with the Greek Cypriots. And we hope that the elections uh, in the south uh, this next month will create a political um, will or political uh, determination on the part of the Greek Cypriot side to come and uh, sit around the table with the Turkish Cypriots to find a comprehensive solution to the Cyprus pe uh, solu uh, problem which has been lingering on for 50 years. As you know, it started in 1963 and this year is going to be the 50th anniversary of the Cyprus issue. Many people do think that it started in 1974, to whom we always say that uh, Amphisip is on the island since 1964. Therefore, there must have been something before 74. And we, 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 I don't want to get into the, you know, like this historical background, but I want to say that we are ready to find a solution to the Cyprus issue, which is becoming a kind of a blocking, um, let's say, element in our drive towards the European Union. It's not helpful for the European Union, it's not helpful for Turkey, but beyond that it's not helpful for the Greek Cypriots. The Greek Cypriots should help understand themselves that what they are doing, um, you know, uh, dragging their feet is not helping them at all. So, um, I...
did not intend to finish it with Cyprus, but it is better that I stop here and maybe take a couple of questions and then we can continue from there. Thank you very much.